Hello, I'm David Tam. I am a professor at Stellenbosch University, and I've contributed these lectures on gene expression uh, to be part of the H3A Bionet course. I uh, want to start a little bit with the central dogma. As you may remember, uh, DNA gives rise to RNA in a process called transcription, and RNA produces proteins through a process called translation. We're going to unfold some of that, though, because there are some particularities about that process that we all need to understand. Uh, as, as we start at the top of this diagram, we see that DNA has an awful lot of uh, segments that are all associated with whether a gene is turned on or not. In the process of transcription, we produce uh, what's sometimes called a heterogeneous nuclear RNA, or a pre-mRNA, uh, that contains everything from the untranslated regions, the UTRs, uh, through all the introns and exons that are part of that gene structure. Before that messenger RNA is, is a mature messenger RNA, it has to splice out those exons to become a particular isoform, a, a particular messenger RNA that derives from that gene. That, in turn, can be translated at a ribosome to produce a, a chain of amino acids that become a protein for that purpose. Now, there are lots of ways in which this process of transcription and translation uh, get regulated, and I've tried to enumerate some of the most important ones here. Even before the process of transcription, the involvement of epigenetics and transcription factors come into play, deciding which genes should be expressed at a given point in time. After transcription, but before translation, there are two pretty major processes. The, the post-transcription steps of capping the messenger RNA, <clears throat> tailing it, adding a, a bunch of A's at the end of the sequence, and also splicing out introns, is uh, an important process that allows us to have multiple possible transcripts for an individual gene. We also have the process of silencing. Many people have heard of microRNAs. These can bind to complementary sequences in the messenger RNAs and cause them to be broken down rather than sent to translation. After translation, of course, there are more things that must be done to these polypeptides to turn them into mature proteins. Among them are signal peptides. These, these signal peptides are usually found at the end terminus of the protein, and they can be more or less a shipping label for where should this protein be shipped in the cell for it to take on its proper role. Similarly, we have post-translational modifications. These are covalent changes that we make to the structure of proteins. Before you may have a protein that's completely inert, but add a phosphorylation in the right spot, and suddenly it springs into action. So there are many, many stages of control before transcription happens, after transcription happens, but before translation happens, and after translation. So why is it important? Why is it biologically useful for us to be able to vary transcription across our bodies? Well, the first is that we are biological systems, <clears throat> and one of the defining characteristics of biological systems is that we are able to respond to stimuli. So if I take a particular drug, that might uh, cause a uh, a, a hormone signal, for example, and that hormone signal may result in um, uh, gene transcription in the proper cell lines. Uh, developmental stages certainly require uh, change the requirements of different cells. So if you were a fetus, the uh, expression that you see in, in a given cell will change from what it looks like when that, that person is an adult. Uh, if you have a teenager, you're going to have different expression than you will if you're a child. So uh, there are certainly uh, developmental reasons why we need to change gene transcription. Tissues uh, are comprised of cell lines, and tissues and cell lines are all going to be very heterogeneous in which kinds of gene expression they call for. So if I pull a, uh, a, a liver cell uh, out of my body, I'm going to see a different pattern of genes turned on or off than I will if I take a bit of a uh, skin cell away. So these, uh, these different cell lines all require different uh, uh, repertoires of proteins in action. And certainly disease uh, can, can alter very significantly what, what gets transcribed. So in transcriptomics, we are trying to measure which messenger RNA copies are present in a particular sample. And hopefully that sample will not be so heterogeneous as to uh, mix lots and lots of tissues together. That would be a real mess. <clears throat> Now, a lot of times when we talk about the transcriptome, we don't talk about messenger RNA, but rather about complementary DNA. And I want to explain why. Messenger RNA is pretty darn unstable. And if you uh, simply leave messenger RNA sitting around, it'll get exposed to RNase molecules, which will digest it all up. So obviously, you're going to distort very much what uh, messenger RNAs are apparently there if you uh, have digested some and not others. <coughs> so. We have two tools that we use for this purpose. 
One is reverse transcription. This is a, uh, a process that we borrowed from a virus. The, we use a RNA-dependent DNA polymerase to manufacture a DNA complement to a messenger RNA molecule. This is a step that's, that wasn't included in the original central dogma because we didn't know biology does this sometimes. So reverse transcription can create a more permanent cDNA copy from messenger RNA. And by having it in DNA, we can use a technique called polymerase chain reaction, which is kind of a molecular photocopier to make lots and lots of copies of the, the DNA molecules. So this gives us the ability to amplify these signals for transcriptome profiling. So think of the transcriptome as the set of messenger RNA molecules, the transcripts that we have in a particular collection of cells. Now we want to measure that, and we have two chief ways that we do that. The first is kind of an old school way. This is the a, a hybridization based approach. The idea being that if you have two uh, cDNA sequences, if they are complementary to each other, they will hybridize. They'll form hydrogen bonds between them, and we can measure that by tracking fluorescence on, on these devices. So the microarray is the principal way that we do that. And the more intense a signal, the, the brighter the light, the more copies of that cDNA that we think uh, we have, the more of that transcript is present. Similarly, we can use sequencers, not just for exome sequencing or whole genome shotgun, but also for measuring cDNAs directly. So if you can measure these, uh, the sequences of these cDNAs, if you have more counts of a particular transcript, you say to yourself, my goodness, I think that gene is on more. So in the uh, microarray case, we're measuring a fluorescent intensity as a measure of abundance. In sequencing, we use the count of sequences produced from that transcript as our proxy for abundance. So let's explain oligonucleotide arrays a little better. Uh, we start with a grid. So we have a, a plate of some sort. Maybe it's a silicon wafer. Maybe it's a, a glass chip, for that matter. Uh, and we have an array of dots that are regularly spaced in the x-axis and in the y-axis. So we have basically a square grid of these of these dots. And you can see a close-up on one of these uh, on, on four of these dots at the upper right of this slide. So every dot is a whole bunch of copies of some probe sequence, some probe DNA sequence that is specific to a particular transcript. Okay, so when we have hybridization, many of these spots, uh, sorry, many of the molecules on this spot are bound to a complementary sequence. Okay, so to, to use a, a very common example, the Affymetrix gene, uh, human genome U133 plus 2 uh, was produced in 2003, and we can see that it measures 47,000 different transcripts with about 1.3 million distinct probe sequences on, on its chip. So you can measure the totality of cellular uh, transcription um, so long as you have a probe on that, uh, on that surface that's complementary to the, D the, the messenger RNA of interest. Now, next generation sequencing is widely, widely used, and, and many think, people think that analysis of uh, sequencing data is bioinformatics. I would beg to differ, but that's fine. The, the chief way that they differ from the old school sequencers is in the number of templates that can be sequenced simultaneously. So if you had a really awesome old school Sanger sequencer, you would have the ability to sequence 384 different uh, template strands all at the same time. And people thought that was amazing when I was in grad school. <clears throat> in next generation sequencing, however, we can simultaneously sequence millions of template sequences. And that's a huge difference. So we tend to produce lower quality sequencer, uh, sequences with next generation sequencing, but we produce so many of them that a lot of those weaknesses are ironed out. So down at the bottom of the screen, you can see one, two, three, four, five different uh, little plates. And I don't want you to think of these as different plates. This is one plate seen at five, at five different moments in time. So we see that there's a top letter T in the first one. And at that same position in the second time, we have an A, a in the fourth we have a G, in the fifth we have a T. What's that, what that's trying to, uh, to show us is that subs uh, in, in subsequent times, we see a different letter being incorporated into the sequence at, each, uh, at, at this particular location on our detection grid. Our detection grid covers millions of sequences, but at this one location, we can track which letter is being incorporated at each of these five time points. And from that, we can infer the sequence 
of that particular location on the plate. It's magic, but it produces a ream of data that we can use. So if I were to start with a simple bench protocol for a DNA microarray experiment, I first have to acquire a, a DNA microarray. Maybe I've purchased one, like the, the Affymetrix one, or an Agilent one for that matter, <clears throat> and that microarray uh, will let me measure anything that has a spot on it uh, in any uh, transcript for which there is a, an appropriate probe sequence. That's great. Most of the time, people just buy these. But if you have a very specialized purpose, like you're working in a non-model organism, you might instead prepare your own microarray uh, by providing your own vials of the probe sequences that are to be uh, affixed to the surface. That's quite a different approach. So we now isolate the messenger RNA from our biological samples. We reverse transcribe them. Remember, we want to get, we want to produce a cDNA because it's more stable than this messenger RNA we're starting with. So we reverse transcribe our cDNA to, to produce our cDNAs. We label them with fluorescent molecules. Uh, and then we hybridize the labeled DNA to our DNA microarray. Then we have to wash, wash off uh, all the, the bits of, um, of messenger RNA, that, or cDNA actually, that, that haven't bound to something specifically. So we wash it off, and then we measure fluorescence across the entire surface of the microarray. And that provides us the quantitative information about how much of each transcript is there. Now we could replace uh, these, these final steps with just sequencing. So instead of uh, the steps uh, four through six that are on the slide, we would Im impose a sequencing-based approach. And we would call that RNA-seq. So when we use a high-throughput sequencer to measure transcripts rather than a microarray, we call that RNA-seq. OK, so lots of takeaways. The genome is static throughout your body. Your skin cells, your liver cells, your brain cells, they all have exactly the same genes. Um, but which genes are expressed is a lot of what gives different cell types their flavor. So uh, we want to be able to measure the uh, expression to a particular cell type. Gene expression for known transcripts can be measured via microarrays using hybridization. That's the process of forming hydrogen bonds between complementary sequences. But RNA-seq allows us to dig even deeper in these data and simply sequence all of the transcripts that are there. Sometimes that leads to some interesting biological insights. So in the next lecture, we'll talk a little bit about how we make sense of these data and we'll include a, little bio, a whole lot of bioinformatics and a little bit of biostatistics, too. I hope you look forward to it.